Welcome to my talk on a simple setup for high-speed camera-based 3D vibration measurements and their use for operational model analysis. My name is Max Gille and I'm a PhD student at the Technical University of Munich. The idea of this study was to enable measuring in three dimensions without using a second camera to achieve an additional viewing angle, which would be pretty expensive, and to see how well this method can be applied to operational modal analysis. And the idea of using mirrors to split a single camera's view is not new and there are several proposed setups. Here we choose a very simple one that only needs one mirror, which you can see here on the left. And the structure that we consider is made of brass and is basically a 15 millimeter thick plate and it's supported relatively flexible in the middle by the rest of the structure. Now a high-speed camera, in our case the Photon Nova S6, is pointed at the structure such that the structure is here visible in the lower part of the image. The blue frame covers the image sensor so you get an idea of what the camera sees. So here in the bottom part we see the original structure, the original surface, and in the top part of the image we see through the mirror and the mirror is adjusted such that we see perfectly um, perpendicular, perpendicular from the top. It looks like the mirror could all, almost touch the structure but it doesn't of course. So there's a small gap between structure and mirror. This setup was chosen to enable a very simple 3D reconstruction of the surface's movement without going through a traditional camera calibration, but just use a very small set of formulas that you see here on the left. Now, in order to find points 3D movements, the two parts of the image that show the surface from two different angles, um, here the mirrored view and the original view, are first analyzed separately using the open source toolbox Pi IDI with the Lucas Canard optical flow algorithm. So what that gives us is really just vertical and horizontal displacements as they are seen on the image sensor. So when some corner moved one pixel to the top or to the right, then Lucas Canard will give us that from the video file. So H and V those are the things that are directly the result of this um, toolbox. And now we have to translate those information to the real world. So we use this coordinate system X, Y and Z. And we want to find those displacements. So now you can see the benefit of having this perpendicular top view. Here we can directly say that what we see through the mirror happening in x uh, in horizontal direction so the delta h in the mirror is exactly what's happening along the x direction of the real world the only thing that we have to apply there is the correct pixel to millimeter um, conversion the same is true for the vertical movement seen through the mirror because there the only thing we can see and without distortion is the y displacement of a point. You can imagine when a point moves in the positive y direction away from the camera, in the mirror that's seen as a movement from top to bottom and that's the vertical, positive vertical direction um, from, from the Lucas Canard algorithm. So those first two formulas are very easy. Also the third one describing now the horizontal observed horizontal displacement in the original view that's that can also be basically interpreted as just a movement in the x direction so that's easy too so we have now x and y displacements lastly we have to analyze what's happening in the vertical direction in the lower part of the image and there we now have a mixture of two real world directions we see partly what's happening in the vertical direction along the z-axis but also some of what's happening in y direction so what we see in vertical direction the original image is 
cosine of phi times the z direction and sine of phi times the y direction, phi being the viewing angle of the camera. So that's still a pretty simple um, formula and as we know why we can extract z from that formula. Yeah, and this set of equations, that's all we need, is now used to find the displacements of all corner points of the chessboard pattern on the surface. But first we want to see how good this reconstruction actually works. So we look at just one corner of this, um, of this, of this surface and we additionally fix an accelerometer on the right on the bottom of the plate at the same position to be able to compare the two results. Of course the acceleration signal is integrated twice such that we have two displacement signals that we can compare properly. Now for this comparison the structure was impacted with an impulse hammer on the edges of the structure. So we impacted here on the front right edge and the graph you see on the left shows the X displacement as identified by our proposed method. That's the solid blue curve and the accelerometer signal is the dashed orange um, curve, of course, the twicely integrated um, acceleration signal. Now both curves show a strong similarity, however there is quite some beat, so this there are two rather close um, frequencies that lead to a period periodically changing amplitude. And that way it's pretty hard to really say much about the quality of the reconstruction. So we therefore will also want to look at it in the frequency domain using the auto power spectrum of the signal you just saw. We're looking here at the frequency range of 300 to 500 hertz, which is the region where the first three eigen frequencies are expected. We see that the vibration at around 380 hertz, which is the first eigenfrequency and a rotation around the z-axis, so something where we expect x displacements, is represented very well by the optical measurements. There's only small deviations. However, a second peak from the, for the second mode uh, eigenfrequency is much more pronounced in the camera measurement. The big picture here is more or less the same for the y direction, so we want to skip that and proceed to the z direction directly. Now in z direction we again start with the time domain. Here we see a very good agreement already. Only the amplitude of the camera measurement, you see the blue curve is slightly, has a slightly larger amplitude, is overestimated, um, which can also be confirmed when looking at the auto power spectral density and there we see this constant offset between the two curves which means that there is just some factor between so something about the scaling is probably wrong but the overall shape of the curve is really very very similar so this looks apart from the factor very very good. Now where could these um, observed errors could come from? There are several sources in our, in our formulas and we want to discuss them here. First of all, um, which has nothing to do with the formulas directly, is that it's not so easy to precisely measure the angle phi. But even if we knew the angle phi very precisely, the problem is that the angle is not constant for the whole surface. One should, if more precision is necessary, use a changing angle along the y-axis. As you can see here in the image, the angle phi is drawn here for the front edge, but if you drew a second line from the far edge of the structure, the angle phi would already be smaller. Here we used just one angle and it was estimated for the middle of the structure. Furthermore, the scaling, so this pixel to millimeter conversion, is not constant for all points. Again, along the y-axis, you can see it here in the bottom picture, the front edge of the structure, although it's a rectangular, so the front edge is as long as the far edge of the structure, but in the image it looks bigger. So also this pixel to millimeter conversion 
is actually not the same. Again, we um, handle this as the same for all points and used the far edge as a reference because that the far edge measure is also true for the mirrored view. So there we have correct values at least. So to keep the influence of these errors as little as possible, the camera should be placed as far away from the structure as possible. Because you can imagine, apart from being difficult to measure the angle phi correctly, all the other errors, they vanish, they would vanish if the camera was placed infinitely far away, because then the light rays would be in parallel. So the only thing that we could do was to use the maximum available focal length of our zoom lens and place the camera uh, as far away but still use as much of the image sensor as possible. Of course we could go even farther away but then we lost um, much of the resolution that the image sensor would give us at full resolution. Finally, despite these known inaccuracies, we want to look at how well mode shapes are estimated when the camera measurements are used for operational modal analysis. In this measurement, the structure was heavily excited with a steel wrench to produce displacements as large as possible. With the 4000 frames per second that we chose, only the first four eigenfrequencies could be assessed, and this slide shows the first two mode shapes. On the left, there's an isometric view and on the right you see one view along one axis that gives a bit um, extra information maybe. So for the first you can pretty clearly see that it's a nice rotation around the z-axis and all the points more or less stay in the x and y plane. And also the second mode shape looks pretty clear. We have a tilting around the y-axis and yeah, we see this very clear picture with only some outliers. So here in this front half of the structure, which is the edge closer to the camera, we have some outliers and yeah, a bit more noisy data. And this is most probably due to not optimal lighting conditions. We only have one flicker-free LED light available, so it's always a bit hard to have optimal conditions all over the structure. But other than that, both mode shapes are identified very well and we see a pretty clear picture. The same is true for mode shapes 3 and 4. Number 4 is the first, I would say, flexible mode shape, as the first three are really just rigid modes of the plate itself, um, bending around, the, around its fixture. And also this, this fourth mode more or less showcases one big benefit of these camera measurements. We have a really, really high spatial resolution and that enables very, very smooth um, mode shape visualization without any post-processing necessary. So directly out of the measurement we can produce these images. Okay, we have some noisy points again on the front edge, but that overall still looks pretty nice. So. That's basically it. I come to my conclusion. We showed that a pretty simple strategy is capable of reproducing 3D information out of a one camera setup and that the results can be useful for operational modal um, analysis applications. However, we have to say that only true to that point for that very simple structure. And the question is, is this also applicable to, to general structures that are more complicated without having too many individual modifications. So this very simple setup, can that be also applied to, to more complex structures? We don't know yet. And that's basically it. If you have any questions or remarks, I'm happy to discuss them during the online forum on February 15th. I'm also always available via, via email, of course. So thank you for your attention and hopefully see you in person at some other event in the near future. Goodbye.